Hey, good morning, JC Nez. Man, great to worship with you guys today, everybody in the house, those worshiping online with us right now. We're so glad you can tune in. And whether you're here in the room or you're worshiping online, you're a regular part of this church family, why don't you help me give, in just a minute, give a rousing welcome and show some great love and appreciation to two groups of people. Number one, all of our first-time guests. Secondly, all of our wonderful soldiers from Fort Riley and their families. Come on, let's show some love and let's show some encouragement. There's a place for you here. Talked to so many this morning already, some just getting back from long extended times away from their family, some soldiers already deployed, some soldiers going to training, like this was their last Sunday for several many weeks, and so we just want you to know we support you, you are on the staying on the home front, we love you, and, and maybe you want to grab that Connect card even now that you received on the way in, or find it online, or grab it from the seat pocket in front of you, and maybe there's something uh, we could come alongside you with, so we pray for you specifically about. You could go ahead and keep that handy, write it down if you know it, or maybe at some point in the service, God will do something just awesome in your life, right? And you want to let us know about that, just go ahead and get that ready and have that prepared, and it'll be, it'll be ready when, when you need it, and you can turn it in uh, when we bring the service to a close and, and give God our tithes and our offerings as well. Man, it's so good to be, it isn't it so, what a gift, amen? What a gift it is to be a part of a healthy, biblical, Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, growing, thriving church family, is it not? Man, this is good. This is so good. Um, it's good that we can come together as a family. We can, we can support and rejoice in the joys and celebrations of life. We can come and walk with each other, alongside of each other, comforting one another. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like we've done recently, we were with the Stevens family and the loss of their four-year-old son. We had that memorial service yesterday, and it was a time of, of sorrow, but also rejoicing, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, and then said goodbye also this last week to a dear brother in the Lord, Bill Kelly. Many of you know him, and We'll have details of his service coming up as well. And so just some, some, some of those realities of life, but it's good to do it together as a family. And today, I want, you to rem I want to remind you why we're here, okay? Why we're here is not just for us and our blessing. We're here to be strengthened by our God, to be equipped, and in a few moments, we're going to be sent out into his mission field, amen? And that's what we're about. So more and more and more and more people, the Bible says the harvest is vast. So more people will come to know Jesus and, uh, and, and join us like this in his family. Well, it's good to be with you. We're, we're continuing on in a series that we started just last week. Just last week, we started a six-week series called Lord Teach Us to Pray. And it's really just a series walking through what we've come to know as the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6 and Luke 11, it's recorded for us. A little different variations in each of those Gospels, but it's there. And it came in response to a question the disciples asked Jesus. We, we looked at that last week. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. As they observed his life, as they observed his closeness with God, they asked that question, and this was Jesus' answer to that question. He gave them this prayer. Not so much as a, as a um, passage to be memorized verbatim and quoted. You can do that. It's not a bad idea to memorize Scripture at all. Um, but he gave it to us as a model, as a pattern for our praying, so we could connect with God at a deeper way. Way than perhaps we ever have. So what we've been doing, our strategy in this series is pretty simple. We've just been taking a phrase each week. We've just been breaking it down phrase by phrase, and we're looking at a phrase each week. We started in the place that Jesus starts with the relationship. He talked to us about our Father in heaven. And then we looked at what it practically means to hallow God's name in our everyday, ordinary lives, and our attitude, relationships, decisions, all, all priorities, everything. We, we want God's name to be honored and worshiped and exalted in, in every everyone we meet. We want them to see God through us. And so we talked about that. If you weren't here or weren't able to be here, you can go back and pick that message up and, and catch right up with us. Today we're going on to the second part of the, of the prayer, which is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I've been looking forward to this, and uh, I'll tell you later, but I'll tell you now too, this is my favorite part of the prayer. This really is. This is an incredible part, and, I, and God spoke to us so powerfully in the first service. I know he's going to be speaking to open and seeking hearts today. So as we get started with this, let me, let me present to you a question, actually a couple questions, and then let me share an honest confession, okay? So here's the question. What do you do what do you do? What, what, when and where does life feel most out of control for you? And then the second part is what do you do when life feels most out of control? What's your response? Okay, so think about that as we go along here this morning. Now my confession. Here's my confession. You say, what, what, what's with the 40 pounds collectively? What's with the 40 pounds of pinto beans and white rice, Pastor Mark? 
This is it. This is my confession. This was, um, there's quite a backstory behind this 40 pounds of rice and beans. And let me give you the short version of it, okay? So here, probably six or eight months ago, I was, I was, it seemed like every week I was meeting for lunch and I was having lots of conversations with some leadership of Fort Riley and some chaplains and, and lots of people in the, in the army community. And then I was having those conversations and then I was taking what I was hearing from this and I was hearing it on the news as well. And then I did what no one should ever, ever do. I took what I was hearing in conversations and I took what I was seeing on the news and I went to social media and I started Googling it. And I started looking it up on YouTube and I was seeing all, all kinds of things, right? And so as, I, as this was kind of working on me and as I was hearing and seeing all this, this was my response. Right, to go to the store, and one night I was in the store by myself, and I just grabbed a big 40-pound bag of rice and a bag of bento beans and a few other things. And I went home, and I told my wife, we're going to build a, I'm going to build a full-fledged food storage facility in our home. And she was like, whatever, do, do you do you? I, I don't know, want to know why you're doing it, just don't make a mess. And so I began to search for a place to do this in our home because she wasn't going to let me put all the canned goods and the rice and the beans in the living room. And so I found a little closet down in the basement. It was really just a utility closet, very, very small, very narrow. And I began to put up shelves in there and I began to buy bags of rice and beans and, and put them on the shelves. That was my response. I learned a lot in and through that process. Number one, I grossly underestimated the amount of food and the quality of food that would be needed to sustain my family over the long haul. If we had to depend on this alone. This would not be enough. And I had a little more, but not much more than this right here. And I began to learn that that was probably um, not realistic. And, and, and here's another problem. I did not finish the shelves. The shelves still aren't finished. And I didn't really buy any more food than this. So this was what was going to get us through whatever. I kind of went from zero to apocalypse in a very short time is what I'm trying to tell you. And I began to reflect on that. Why, why did I do that? Why? It's not, I'm not saying it's bad. Some of you are like, what's the problem, right? We, we got a lot of food, and that's fine. I'm not food preparedness, food storage to sustain your family in, in, a, in a whatever in a, for a short time or bless others, okay? But I, I just began to reflect on why I did it. And if I'm just being really honest with you, here, here's the reason. I was bombarded by the what-ifs of life. For a period of time, I became kind of consumed with the what-ifs of life. I'm not saying we're not going to throw this away. I mean, we'll probably use it. It's, it's good to have in, in, in storage, but I was, I was consumed. I started thinking about what-ifs, like what if, what if the supply chains totally shut down and the grocery stores cannot restock? What, what if we have an EMP strike? If you don't know what that is, please do yourself a favor. Don't research it. Don't Google it. It's quite frightening. You can go down quite a trail, and, and so um, <laughs> I say, what if an EMP strikes and we totally get off the grid? What if we totally have to go back to primitive living? What will I do? Um, what, if, what if total anarchy and chaos result? What if we get into a full-fledged war with Russia and China simultaneously and shipping lanes are cut off and there is no shipping and everything is brought to a screeching halt in life and all of this and you know what my you know what my strategy was go buy 40 pounds of rice and beans that's going to get us through world war three right I, I don't know um so anyway what ifs right and i think we probably all can understand and we can admit like when when the world starts to feel out of control when your world starts to feel out of control in your own family and life the what if questions start to fly don't they the what ifs we're bombarded we're we're consumed with them the the what ifs what might be what what could be right and so so i just want to you could probably add your your own list of what ifs to to mine but but you know, we, we, we ask them, don't we? We ask them, what if, what if it's cancer? Or what if the cancer comes back? Or what if I lose my job? What, what if we can't pay the bills? What if I get sick? What if I get really injured and we can't, we can't, we lose the home? What, what if one, one of, uh, what if our child gets sick? What if they end up in the hospital? What if, what if one of our child dies? What if our kids do this? What if our kids don't do this? What, what if our identity gets stolen? What if we go out into a crowd to celebrate something in our community and people start shooting the place up? 
right? Lots of what ifs questions. And you, again, you probably have your own list of what ifs you could add to that. But what I want to do is we continue to walk through this wonderful, powerful prayer. And as we specifically get to this part today, I want to show you, I think you're going to see it from Jesus himself, how this is such a powerful and effective antidote to the times we all come to in life when life feels out of control. When, when we're hammered by the what ifs. And, and honestly, I, I've been praying that part of what would happen in this series at least is, is not that we would just learn a little more about the Lord's Prayer or that we would even memorize it. That's good. I think that's a great thing to do. But again, I pray that our awe and our wonder and our desire and our passion and our persistence for prayer would grow. I, I've been praying among us, like everyone who calls us their church home, whether you worship here or online, that, that a, a fresh new, deep, vibrant prayer life would begin to grow out of your life, that we would be captivated once again by the indescribable gift and the privilege of this thing called prayer. And so we're looking at the Lord's Prayer, and you know, in these weeks leading up to Easter and the incredible celebration we're going to have, by the way, let me get that question back out in front of you. We've been asking it for weeks now. We're going to continue to ask it all the way up to to Easter. But here's the question, who is going to meet Jesus? Who's going to have their life and their eternity transformed because of Jesus and because of me, my influence? And so I hope you, you, you have an answer to that question before it's all said and done. And I hope on Easter Sunday, if not before, there's going to be somebody sitting next to you who, needs to, who, who will be in a place and God will open their hearts to hear a life-transforming message, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. So keep asking yourself that question. But as we prepare our hearts leading up to that incredible celebration of Easter, these weeks are a phenomenal opportunity to contemplate the cross. Amen? To contemplate the cross and to consider all that Jesus endured, all that he willingly um, took on himself so he could show us the full extent of his love and offer us the the gift of eternal life. But what I think the incredible thing about Jesus going to the cross, when I think about what he did for me, I mean, I I praise him that eternal life was purchased for me. I praise him that now through his death and sacrifice and resurrection, I have eternal life, and I'm grateful for that. But I, I think it's even more wonderful than that. Jesus going to the cross... Purchase for me eternal life, but it's not just eternal life someday, sometime down the road when I cross out of this life into the next. That is a wonderful thing, but it's even better than that. It's that Jesus enables us now through his death and resurrection to experience true life, abundant life, the fullness of life here and now, right here in this present present life. In fact, that's why he came. That's why he said he came. In John 10, 10, he talks about the enemy and his agenda, but then he adds, I have come so that they may experience life in all of its fullness, abundant life, the fullness of life. And so when we look at the life and we look at the example of Jesus, what we begin to see, we, we begin to see is exactly what the fullness and abundance of life looks like. It looks like a relationship with God, doesn't it? It looks like oneness with God. It looks like closeness with God. And Jesus shows us how incredible life can really be and what kind of amazing blessing is available to us in being in right relationship with God and knowing Him and drawing close to Him and walking with Him and listening to Him every single day as our Father in heaven. And understand that kind of life That kind of gift begins the very moment that you open up your heart and invite him in and you put your faith in him and your trust and your hope in him as Lord and as your Savior. But Jesus shows us, I believe better than anybody, he shows us how this kind of life, this true life, this fullness of life, how it's cultivated, how it's strengthened, and he shows that it happens through prayer. You know, for Jesus, prayer was absolutely essential. When he walk this earth as a man, as, as God in the flesh, it was, it was absolutely vital and central. It was never kind of this optional, kind of second thought kind of thing. It was absolutely vital to his relationship with God, as important and as natural to Jesus as breathing. You know, we never hear anybody said, you know, I, I think breathing is very important. I like the idea of breathing, but my goodness, I have so much going this week, I don't even have time to breathe. I'm sorry. Nobody says that. 
But I've done it, and you've done it, and we do it quite often with prayer, don't we? I, I just don't have time to pray, but or time to pray. But but Jesus showed us that it's it's not just a ritual you do. It's not a check the box. It's a lifestyle. In fact, Jesus' very last words from the cross, in his very last breath, it was really a prayer. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He. That's the final thing he prayed from the cross. And then if you go over to Mark chapter 15, what you see there is after he prayed that prayer and after he breathed his last, the curtain, the curtain in the temple was ripped clean in two. That that 60 foot tall curtain that separated the holy of holies from the rest of humanity. No one could look in there. No one could go in there except the high priest. And only with a bunch of rituals and and, and a bunch of... um, uh, uh, you know, essential, necessary things to do. And only then, once a year, could the high priest go in there. No one else could go. But when Jesus died, when he said, I breathe my last, and he, into your hands I commit my spirit, he says, that curtain was ripped in two. And it adds a very, very important detail. It wasn't just ripped in two. It was ripped in two in a very specific way. How many of you have read your Bibles and know this? It was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. That, that's not a side note. That's not just a little extra detail. That is very, very essential. It was God's way of showing that no human hand did this. It wasn't, no one put a sword in there and ripped it and tore it apart from the bottom up. It was torn from the top to the bottom. In other words, this was God saying, this was my hand that did this. No human hand. Right? It was God's way of saying, look, now you have an all-access pass to my presence and to my power. It was God's way of saying, there is no more separation. The curtain was ripped in in two from top to bottom. It was an amazing thing. And now, because of what Christ has done, because of him coming and giving his life as a perfect sacrifice, establishing this new covenant, because of what Christ did in taking away all of our sin and all of our shame and bridging the gap of separation because of our sin, now there is a new and living way opened up for us to have relationship with God. And now, now we can approach him confidently. We can approach him freely. We can approach him with great boldness. And we can experience from the Father This fullness of life. That curtain ripping in two was God's way of saying, I'm not okay with the separation. I want want to have a relationship. I want you to be close to, to me. And that's what the author of Hebrews was getting at when he wrote in Hebrews 4. He said, let us then, all of us, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I love that. That is a wide open invitation to say you can come to God anytime, you can come to God anywhere you are, just as you are, 24-7, you can come to him with boldness and confidence, you can pray anytime, you don't have to light a candle before you pray. I mean, you can, it's, it's fine, you can do that if you want to, but you don't have to jump through all these hoops, and you don't have to do a bunch of spiritual calisthenics to get to God and enjoy communion and fellowship with him. You don't have to spend days upon days buttering him up and getting on his good side and trying to be good enough to to where he will hear your prayer. You don't have to try to be righteous. You, in Christ, you're already righteous. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for you, to be sin for me, and that in him we might become the righteousness of God, which means that because of all that Christ did for us, because of all that he accomplished for us and invites us into, you can draw near to God and you can come as close as you want to. Do you realize that today, church? You can be as close to God as you want to be. You can be as close as you want to be. You don't have to stand far off. You don't have to settle for a view from the cheap seats. You can come right into his presence. You can approach him, yes, with awe. Yes, with the proper respect and reverence. Absolutely, he's God. But you can approach him with boldness and with confidence. And so I've been thinking about this all week. If we have this amazing privilege, if we've been given this indescribable invitation and access to approach God with confidence, to find mercy and grace and help in our time of need. Here's the question. Why do we settle for staying back here? 
Why do we so often settle for standing far off from God and going days, maybe even weeks, maybe longer without ever talking to our Father? I I know there's lots of explanations and lots of reasons, but I, I think one of the reasons is this. When we find ourselves at a point of need in our life, when it feels like the world is shaking and, 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 and our world is, is chaos and, and the wheels are coming off of our world, when, when we find ourselves troubled and hammered by the what-ifs, here's what I think we tend to do. We tend to pull out these. And instead of seeking God out in prayer, we, we search out Google. If we're honest, we, we take our what-ifs to the internet. Come on, you got to affirm the convicting stuff too, church, amen. Not just the blessing stuff, amen. You may with me? We take our what ifs to the internet. Oh my, what is this spot on my hand? It looks like a pumpkin. Let me find out what it is, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna research it. And and I'm just telling you, nobody ever, after hours and hours of searching out things that might be wrong in their life and trying to find remedies for them on the internet, no one ever walked away from that saying, Wow, I feel so much more at rest and so much more full of peace and joy. No, we don't do do that because that's not where it's found. You know, it used to be it used to be that when we when we were bored or when we had downtime, we prayed. But we don't have downtime anymore. We're never bored anymore. A guy by the name of Blaise Pascal, how many of you heard of him? He was a French physicist and, and, and mathematician and inventor genius galore. He, he said this, he said, and don't, don't, don't start debating with him in your head about whether this is true in all areas. Just, just hear the heart of what he's saying here, okay? All of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Do you know when he said this? He said this in 1654, 350 years before we all had supercomputers in our pockets. And we're not bored anymore. There is no downtime. We, we fill it with this. Have you, if you want to do a little experiment, you, maybe you have done this, go to a waiting room of any kind. Go to a hospital waiting room. Go to the lobby of a restaurant where people are waiting for their tables and just look, get off your phone long enough to look at others and everybody's face will be glowing. Sometimes even while they're sitting at the table with their family, they're in their phones. And don't mishear me. I'm not saying that all technology is evil and you got to get rid, you got to dump your phones in the trash can on the way out. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying, though, is as we journey through this prayer, I'm just challenging. I think it's healthy. I think it's good. I think God would do something with it if we would examine our lives and we just ask some really challenging questions of ourselves. Is this, is media, is social media, is this helping me to experience the abundant fullness of life that Jesus Christ died and rose again to give me? Is it? Is this this helping me to grow more sensitive to my Father's voice? Is this really helping me to experience that closeness and that oneness and that awareness of His faithful presence? Is this, is this helping me be more obedient to him? And if not, may, maybe there's some changes that need to take place. Maybe there's a shift in priorities. Can I ask you a tough question, a really tough question? I'm going to meddle just a little bit, okay? When's the last time you checked your screen time? Everybody's like, out of here, got to go. It's time to go. I, I, the last report I heard on average screen time was astounding. The average user uses their phone six hours and 54 minutes a day. Some of you were saying, well, that would be an improvement for me, actually. If if I'm just being honest, that would be a, you know, (laughs) I'm using a lot more than that, right? Maybe, but you're bringing the average way up. But six hours and 54 minutes. And so, again, I'm not saying you stop using your phones. I'm just saying what that stat does for me is it totally annihilates the most common excuse I hear on why we can't develop a vibrant, growing, faithful prayer life, and that is I don't have the time. That stat totally annihilates that. Do you think we could carve out 30 minutes out of that 6 hours and 54 minutes a day that I'm on this to spend with the Father? Maybe an hour in His Word, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe something to think about, right? You see, I don't, what I'm saying is I don't think time is the issue. 
I think it's a value and priority issue. And it really confronts us with what Jesus said. Jesus said in, 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 the, in the Gospels, he said, seek first, Matthew, seek first, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else you could ever need in this life will be given to you. I, I, I'm the source of it. I'm not, I'm not an unwilling father, but, but I want you to get the order right. I want you to get the priority of life right because it doesn't work if we get it out of order. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first. And so the question is, how do we arrange our lives? How do we prioritize our day so that we can seek God more, so we can experience more and more and more of what God, our Father, wants to do in us and through us? And so that's why, starting last week, we just started giving the challenge, what if? What if every single morning you got up and before you, maybe before you even got out of bed, or as you got out of bed, the first thing you did before grabbing this and looking through Twitter and Instagram and your emails and your texts and, and, and all the news headlines and all that, maybe the first thing, by, by the way, I've done it that way. I've done it that way first. I've grabbed that first and did all that first. And then I couldn't figure out for the life of me why I was in such a bad mood before I even left the house. It's because all of this was just washing over me. What if, what if, what if, and Oh my goodness, I can't believe that. And then all this was washing over me and influencing me. But what if, what if instead of grabbing this first or turning to human conversation first, we turned to conversation with our Father and we said, we just instilled this in quietness for a few minutes and said, Our Father, what, our Father, I have a Father in heaven. And then we let those phrases, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. This week, you, you just focus the whole week on that phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is. And let that influence your thanksgiving and your praise and your questions and your confession, maybe even your repentance, your, your commitments to God as far as action steps. You just let those phrases influence all that and you begin to pray that. What, what would change in your life if you begin to do that? Maybe you would start to experience what Isaiah in Isaiah 26.3 starts to talk about. You, God, will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in you whose thoughts are fixed on you. I don't know if you caught the, the, the dual responsibility there in that verse. There's God's part and then there's our part. Did you catch it? God's part, God's faithful to his promise is that he will keep you in perfect peace. Even when you're, it feels like your world is out of control, even when you're getting bombarded and consumed by all the what ifs, you will be kept in perfect peace. Not escaping it, but in the middle of it, amen. Our job, our responsibility is to trust him and to fix our thoughts on him. And so maybe one of the powerful ways and practical ways we could do this is just take these phrases each and every week as we go through them and begin to spend some time lingering in each room. You know, we, we used that analogy last week, like each phrase is a room inside a mansion that we could just spend time in God's presence in to help express our our prayers to God, but then also just spend time listening to God as well. And so today we come to this part of the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. And I've already shared it with you. I, I don't know if we are allowed to have favorite lines in the Lord's Prayer, but this is my favorite line. This is my favorite part of the Lord's Prayer. And the reason I think it is for me is because it's just one of those moments where, where I just feel like it just picks me up. It's just, it just lifts me up and above the fray of life and the chaos and confusion and noise of life and just helps me center again and focus again on what's really true and what's ultimately going to matter and I love this section of the Lord's Prayer. And so your kingdom come. Let's talk about the word kingdom for a moment because that's not a word we use very often. It, it comes from a word, from a two-part word. Kingdom really is king's domain. Kingdom, king's domain. And what is the king's domain? The king's domain is the effective range of God's will. It's the place where what the king wants happens. It's, it's, the, it's the range of what the king says is authoritative. It, what the king says goes. And so God's kingdom in heaven is the place where his good, pleasing, and perfect will comes to pass. It's the place where his power and his presence is operating in all of its fullness. It's the place where God rules and reigns and his authority is supreme. That's God's kingdom. And so when Jesus, though, when he began this public ministry, he came onto the scene and he said things like this in Matthew 3, 2. Repent 
of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. I like another translation. It says it this way. It says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if you could just, uh, why don't you do this with me? Why don't you get in the message here this morning and just, even if you're watching online, you can do this in your living room. Just put your hand out in front of you for a moment, okay? Plenty of room between the rows. You can just put your hand out. Like, how far can you reach? About that far, right? Right? You can put your hands down. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is at hand. In other words, the kingdom of heaven, with my arrival, with my coming, with, with my incarnation, with me on the scene now, sit here by the Father to, to show you who the Father's like, to give my life as a ransom for many. Now the kingdom of heaven is near. It's close. In fact, it's so close, you can touch it. You don't have to wait for it someday, way off out there. You can experience and enjoy the kingdom of God right now here right now. You can experience God's presence and power in your life right here, right now. You can, we can experience God ruling and reigning in our hearts by faith right here and right now. So God has a kingdom. Did you know you have a kingdom as well? You do. You have a kingdom. You have a range where what you say goes. You have a range where what you decide happens. Here's, a, here's an easy, simple example. You got up this morning, and in the domain of your kingdom, you decided what you were going to wear to worship. Okay? You decided that. You, you are, you, in your kingdom, you decided what you were going to wear. And some of you made a really, really great decision. And some of you, no, just joking, just joking, just, just joking at all. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you look great. Come on, go ahead, turn to your neighbor, affirm them. Say, you look great. Right? Now turn back to that same neighbor and say, who cares? Right? Who cares? Because man looks at outward appearance, doesn't he? And when we're gathered like this in his presence in worship, God is looking at the heart. I have people ask me from time to time when I invite them to be a part of our worship and, and come, to, come to church here. I, I, I often hear this question, I would love to come, I will come, but what, what do we wear? There's some people, do you realize there's some people that come here each and every week. Some of them have not been in church in maybe 20, 30 years. They've not been. They don't, they don't know what church is like anymore. They haven't been in a long time. You guys are having that kind of influence on this community, amen? With your invitations and your love and your service, people are coming that have been away for a long time. So it's great. But I get that question, what do we wear? And I usually just respond like this. Hey, as long as you have clothes on, we're good. Right? We're good. Because God cares far more about the posture of your heart than the price tag of your clothes, Correct? Right, so, so, um, so there's that. But if you really want to learn about personal kingdoms, just go spend time with any two- or three-year-old. Because the favorite word of a two- and three-year-old is mine. My food, my candy, my toy, right? It's, it's mine. That's, that's kingdom language, by the way. And they learn that very, very early in life. I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I, I've had times in my life where I've got into a bit of a struggle, and we've had a little debate about kingdoms in our home with our kids, right? All my kids have been wonderful. They were not like out of control, rebellious, but, but they have self-wills. They have sinful natures just like every one of us do. And so sometimes uh, our kingdoms would clash a little bit. And, and, and maybe even as a teenager, they would say things like this, well, it's my room. And I'm like, okay, uh, let's take a deep breath and let's consider your room is in my house, <laughs> right? And if, if I need to, if you're going to be, you know, disrespectful and ignore our directions, then we can take the door off of your room. We can strip your room down to the bare essentials if we need to, right? And so, because that's my kingdom, right? And then, and, but then sometimes, if I'm honest, sometimes that gets, that gets transferred to other things that it shouldn't, right? I, I can transfer to other areas of my life, my finances, my possessions, my other belongings, my resources. And then I am quickly reminded, as I start to think, well, this is mine, this is my kingdom, and these are my things, and my will. The Lord quickly reminds me um, in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 
and all who live in it. See, God is the, he's our father, but he's also the sovereign one who sits alone in power and authority on his throne. And he alone sees every square inch of the universe. He's the owner. He's the rightful ruler of it all. And so sometimes it is tempting to make a long list of things that we consider ours. You know, our house, our vehicles, our bank accounts, our possessions, our collections, our money, and call them mine. God looks at that and he's like, mm, I don't, I don't. That's not reality. Really, I'm the owner of everything. I'm the ruler. Not because God is some some wicked dictator, but because he and he alone is the source of them all. And we wouldn't have any of it if it wasn't for him. And it's good to remember that. It's good to remember that he's the owner and my role is really a manager. That's all of our roles. We're just managers of God's possessions. Uh, My wife and I, we try to keep that in view every single week. As we're making decisions about money, as finances, investments, and giving, and, 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 and all that stuff. Because we, we realize that we're just, we're just managing, we're managing a house for God. He lets us live there, praise God. But it's his house, and we're managing a few vehicles for him. And we've got, uh, we're managing a few accounts with some money in those few accounts. But it's really all his. So one of the things we do, we've made a decision ever since we've been married, 25 years now, is to say, God, every single week we're going to return a portion of that. We call it the tithe, and we bring, at minimum, we bring 10% of all that he's, all that he's given to us that week through whatever, and we bring it back to him in honor and praise and, and a reminder that he's the owner of it all. And if God wants us to do something different with it, then he's the ruler. He just says the word, and, and, and we, we will respond. But given that truth, given that truth, the very, very best thing we could do, especially when life feels out of control, the best response ever is to take our little kingdom and fully and joyfully submit it to him as the king. To to bring our lives under the authority with nothing held back of his kingdom. And I bet you could do this if you, if you thought hard enough. If you begin to trace it back through your life, I know in my life, when things start to feel the most out of control, when things start to feel chaotic and out of control, when I start to get most by, bombarded by the what-ifs of life, it's those moments, I could trace it right back, those moments where I forget that No, it doesn't all belong to me, and I am not ultimately in control. I don't ultimately rule and reign. Our Father does. And I'm telling you, when we forget that is when life begins to feel most stressful and most joyless and most exhausting. Because I'm telling you, you were not created. We were not created to live like that. That is not not the way. Instead, Jesus says, let me show you a better way. Let me, you want to know how to pray? You want to know how to relate to the Father? Let me teach you. Our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life, in our church, in my family, in my marriage, in my ministry, in my work, just as it is in heaven. God, just as your power and your presence influences things in heaven, may that be the reality of my life. Just as you rule and reign in heaven, God, operate like that in my life for your glory and for your glory alone. I joyfully and willingly submit my kingdom to your kingdom. Maybe this will help right here. Maybe this will help. Every time we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, think of it like this. It's an obedience prayer. It's an obedience prayer, right? Every time we decide to do God's will instead of our own will, we advance the kingdom. Every time we decide, Ephesians 5.10, to find out what pleases the Lord instead of seeking to please ourselves, we advance his kingdom. We gain ground for the kingdom. Every time we repent and we turn totally away from sin instead of hiding it and holding on to it, the kingdom comes. Every time I turn my eyes away from that which is impure and lustful and I decide to live in self-control and I decide and I remember that I am bought with a price and therefore I'm to honor God with my body. Every time we do that, the kingdom comes. Every time we are courageous enough to stop and shut down gossip and slander in our midst, the kingdom of heaven comes comes, amen. Every time we show compassion and kindness to, to an outcast or the least of these, 
that the world considers an outcast, I should say, the kingdom of heaven comes. Every time we give and serve faithfully and generously and sacrificially, the kingdom of heaven comes. Every time we forgive someone, that our flesh and everything within us is screaming, no, they don't deserve it. Every time we step out in faith and forgive, the kingdom of heaven comes. Amen? Amen. And every time, amen, praise God, and every time, Every time we pray this powerful prayer and we live out of the obedience and surrender of this prayer at the dozens and dozens of crossroads that we experience every single day, maybe every single week, listen, every time we do that, we see the wonderful answer to this prayer coming to life right before our very eyes. And of course, Jesus is our ultimate model of this. I love this. He doesn't just teach us to pray this prayer. He lives it out. He modeled this for us. Remember, at one of the hardest, darkest, most crushing, painful times of his life, in the Garden of Gethsemane, just hours away from the cross, he went with his disciples into the garden, he left them there, and he went on a little further, and he spent time, he got alone with the Father, and he prayed this, Father, if you are willing, let this cup of suffering pass from me. In other words, what he was saying was, if we can do this, if we can accomplish your plan for redemption of people any other way besides me being nailed to a cross, I'm all for it. That's what he was saying. But here it is. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. And in that moment, the kingdom of God was advanced in such a powerful way. Here's what I'd like us to do for just a minute. Our team's back on stage, not because the service is over. I'm going to say just a few more things after this, but I thought this would be an incredible moment to come before the Lord and just live this out and practice it before we get on with the rush and the busyness and the noise of life. And maybe this morning you would want to come to your own Garden of Gethsemane moment. You would need to come to that place of saying, Father, not my will, not my kingdom, but yours be done. Maybe you are being bombarded by the what-ifs of life right now, and you're, you're responding by holding on to control and trying to make things happen, and maybe life feels very out of control. Maybe it's, a, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a priority issue. Maybe you've been convicted, which is a good thing, by the way, of saying, look, I, I know something needs to change. I, I, need to make, I, need to make, I need to make my father a greater priority, and, and he's going to show you how to do that. Maybe there's lots of things that would need to happen right now, but I think something incre- God would do something incredible among us if we just pray this from our hearts, say, Jesus, be the center of my life. Father, nothing else matters. This is what I want more than anything else. Amen? You just want to get quiet before God and sing this from your heart. The words will be on the screen if you don't know it, but let's just spend this some time saying, Father, may your will be done. be the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all from beginning to the end it's always been it's always been you Jesus Jesus cause nothing else but Jesus, you're the 
thought maybe us experiencing that together could uh, encourage you to take that into your week. Maybe you'd want to download that song. It's pretty easy to find. It's called Jesus at the Center. There's lots of versions on YouTube and Spotify. You could find that. Maybe, Maybe if the Lord leads you, you'd want to play that, and then you begin to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. In my life on earth, just as it is in heaven. As we close, I just want to ask you this. What do you do What do you do? What's your response when what you hoped for, what you expected, what you prayed for doesn't happen? What do you do? do where do, Where do you go? Jesus shows us, Jesus shows us that the best response, the best prayer, the one that anchors you in the storm, that one that gives you strength when you are weak, the one that fills you with joy and peace in the midst of uncertainty is to pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. I I was reading a devotional writing not too long ago, and the author said this. The author said this powerful prayer, and really you could talk about prayer in general, But this prayer of radical surrender and obedience is what transforms our what-ifs into even-ifs. Isn't that awesome? Some of you know instantly where that comes from. It comes from that Daniel 3 passage, and I don't have time to read it for you or, or to talk about it. But these three guys, they had a decision to make out of their obedience and surrender to God. They, they told the king in Daniel 3, you'll have to read it, it's awesome, even if... <laughs> Not what if we get thrown in the fire, what's going to become of us, what if we die. But even if we do, we will never bow down, O King. We're going to worship the Lord God alone. And so I love this. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It transforms our what ifs into even ifs. So now it becomes, even if the cancer returns, I will praise you. Even if that person that I love and I think I need so much in my life, they leave, I will trust you. Even if I don't get the job, I will trust you. Even if, even if what the worst that I can imagine happens, I will serve you and I will trust you and I will depend on you and I will live my life to give you and you alone all the glory. Amen? Your kingdom come, your will be done. You know, church, trying to take hold of things and control them and force things to happen and live out of my kingdom, it it seems reasonable, perhaps. It seems what the world would tell us to do, but I'm telling you, it ends in a dead-end road every single time. But choosing to pray and to live out of your kingdom comes and your will be done on this earth, in my life, in my marriage, in my ministry, in my family, just as it is in heaven I'm telling you, that's what leads to true life and the fullness of life and abundant life and life that never, ever ends. 
And church, let me just challenge you and encourage you with this last thing. There is no end to what God do, would do in and through a church like this. And there is no end to how many lives will be transformed for Him. If we go in His power and go in His presence and live a your kingdom come, your will be done kind of life every single day. Amen? Amen. Man, it's been good. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for the power of your word. I just simply pray one thing, that your Holy Spirit would go with us. You would continue to speak to us about your will for our lives and what all that you want to accomplish in and through us. Father, we're listening. Our hearts are open. You lead. We will follow. I pray this in your name. If you just keep your head bowed, please, your eyes closed for one more prayer, for one more minute. This is just really an invitation. This is an invitation to any of you who would say, look, I'm not where I need to be with God. I, I need to be closer. And I know all of us, even every Christian in this room would say, I want to be closer to God. But I, I'm really talking to those of you right now that God brought you here. Nobody's here by accident. That God brought you here and you realize I'm not where I need to be with God. And the reason for that is because of the sin that has become a barrier between you and God. And that's not a statement of judgment or condemnation. That is just a... An, an, a statement that to bring you to the awareness that you don't have to live like that. God can forgive all of that. He can make you brand new from the inside out. He can forgive and cleanse and restore everything. He, he, it's like you were born again, the Bible says. So if you've come here with that awareness and that, that, that understanding, like, I, I need God. And I, I, I've never in my life remember praying that God would forgive me for those sins and make me his very own. I never remember reaching out to Jesus and saying, Jesus, be my Savior. If, if you've never done that, today's your day. Today's the point of decision. So what's going to happen is I'm going to simply pray a prayer as we close here. You're not going to be asked to stand or speak out or come up front or anything. We would never embarrass you in any way. But if you say, I, I, I need to pray that prayer, I'm going to pray that prayer with you. Pastor Mark, would you just put your hand up right now? Just slip it up right now. Praise God. Anybody else? You've never done that. You said, I've never, I need to pray this right now. I just feel urging in my heart to do this. If that's you, you can pray this prayer with us right now. Man, praise God. Let's pray this together. It's just a simple calling out to God in faith to say, Father, I come to you this morning and I need you. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, my Savior. And I open my heart wide to him right now. I invite him into my life. Come, fill me with your spirit, oh God. I, I, I repent of every sin. I turn away from it, God. I turn away from my old life and I turn to you, Jesus, to accept the gift of the new life that you alone make possible. God, come and guide and direct my life for your glory. I, I belong to you from this moment forward. I'm living from you for you this moment forward. God, show me, strengthen me. God, I believe you are the Son of God. You died on the cross rose again from the dead, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for making me your own. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. A good amen. All right. Praise God. Hey, let's, let's give the Lord glory, and thanks for that. I know some major decisions were made. Listen, the, first, the best thing you can do is let someone know about that. If you've made that life-altering decision, it doesn't mean life's going to be perfect or, or free from all hardships, but, man, your life has changed. You've got a new power and a new strength, and, and you're living for a different kingdom now. Let somebody know. So take that Connect card that you, we talked about earlier or fill it out online. You've got a special prayer request. Let us know about your next step. We'd love to encourage you in that and, and, and pray for you about that. Amen.